Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Church Online. My name is Pastor Lewis, and I'm one of the pastors here at Gladeview Church, and I'm so glad that you decided to spend a little part of your Sunday with us. Today, we're going to go through a message that is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 21. So I'm going to ask you to start turning there right now. And uh, throughout this whole entire time, we've been going through a series that we've been calling Through the Chaos. And in that series, we saw how Jesus wanted to give us confidence. Jesus wanted us to give us uh, comfort even through the chaos. And now as we enter into this Easter season, into this Easter week, we're going to be starting a brand new series that we're calling Freedom. Freedom. Say that with me at home, guys. Freedom. There you go. Well, this series is going to be all about the freedom that Jesus came to give us. It's going to be a three-part series. We're going to be starting today on, on Palm Sunday. We're going to be continuing it on Friday, Good Friday. We're going to have a service for you then. And then on Sunday, we're going to finish it off on Easter morning. So I'm excited about this series. I'm excited to see what Jesus has done for us, how he has set us free and given us that freedom. So I hope you tune in for all three of those messages. But without further ado, let's get started with our passage. So it's in Matthew chapter 21, verses 6 through 11. And the word of the Lord says this, The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. Now let's pause here for a second. Jesus had sent his disciples ahead of him to go retrieve these two animals, a donkey and her colt. And it goes on and it says this, They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. So Jesus sat on the cloaks. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this passage. God, I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to enter into Jerusalem, marking the moment where we were going to have freedom, God. God, I just ask you to help us to understand this passage and help us to be able to uh, discern what you have for us today. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, the title of today's message is called Freedom from Sin. Say that with me. Freedom from Sin. We love to take notes, so if you're taking notes with you, write that down as the title of today's message, Freedom from Sin. And I want to start today's message by talking to you guys a little bit about my childhood favorite team. Now, if you've lived in Miami or, or you know anything about uh, the city of Miami, we're really big about the Miami Heat. As a matter of fact, I was a huge Heat fan growing up. I remember the first time I ever watched the Heat game. I was watching basketball. A whole bunch of my friends were talking about the basketball games and the Heat games and all this stuff. And I tried to get into it. I would watch it on the TV and I would try to catch some games. And uh, this was back in the 90s. And I tell you, I got hooked. I loved the game of basketball, especially watching the Heat play. But growing up as a Heat fan, especially in the 90s, it was very tough. It was hard to be able to to watch your team play game after game after game only to lose when they went into the playoffs. And every year we were getting better and better and better. We had players like Alonzo Mourning. We had players like Tim Hardaway, PJ Brown, all these different players, Dan Marley. You know, we had Thunder Dan playing for our team, Jamal Mashburn, all these different players that were playing for our team. And yet, year after year, the Heat would lose in the playoffs, either to the Knicks, which were our enemies, or we would lose to the Bulls, to Michael Jordan and the Bulls in those, in those Eastern Conference Finals. And it was a sad time to be a Miami Heat fan. However, uh, later on, we, we were able to get a championship because we had... We were able to draft Dwayne Wade, and we were also able to draft. We were also able to get Shaquille O'Neal on our team, and he brought us a championship to Miami. It was a thing that we wanted so so much, and it was a, a joyous time in Miami. It was a, a monumentous time. However, I want to rem- I, I want to show you. I want to tell you about a time where the Heat did something where nobody saw this coming. 
As a matter of fact, it was so unprecedented what they did that they even had a welcoming ceremony. And many of you guys know this, back in 2010, the Miami Heat signed the Heatles. And the Heatles, composed of Dwayne Wade, who was still in his prime playing a great basketball game, we were able to sign free agent Chris Bosh to come to the Miami Heat and to top it all off, we signed LeBron James onto our team. He made this huge announcement on the television known as The Decision, where he said, I'm taking my talents to South Beach. And let me tell you, church, when I heard that news, I was watching on the TV, I was so excited. This made my day. As a Heat fan, I knew that by having all three of these guys together, we were gonna have a championship. We were gonna win. We were gonna have victory. And not only that, but I, I at, at that time, I had just purchased season tickets. Yes, your pastor was a season ticket holder to the Miami Heat when we had all three of them. And because I was a season ticket holder, I got invited to a welcoming ceremony that they were hosting for the Miami Heat trio that had just landed in Miami. And I tell you, that day, I was so excited. I brought all my friends. I only had a few limited tickets, so I brought as many people as I could with me. And I remember watching in anticipation as everybody in the stadium was waiting for these players to be revealed. And all of a sudden, you see all the lights go dark. And when those lights went dark, we knew what was coming. You saw fireworks start shooting up from all over the arena and on the screen, out of risers, out of the stage, came the three Heat players, LeBron James, Chris Bosh, and Dwayne Wade. And all three of them came out of at the same time. This was a moment of victory. Now, it was important because they had they claimed that because of this union, because of what they had done, joined together forces in the NBA, they were going to have victory and bring championships to Miami. Now, church, why do I share with you this story? Well, this story is an image of what the Heat were going to do. See, the Heat had not accomplished anything. All they had done was sign with the Miami Heat. They had not accomplished any single thing. Not a single game had been played. And yet, there was celebration. There was this, this, there was this aura of victory that we could feel because the Heat had done the impossible, signed the three biggest free agents of that time. And we knew that victory was imminent. Now, why do I share this story with you? Well, in the same way, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, in this story that we just read, as Jesus is coming in, sitting on a donkey, Jesus himself is proclaiming victory. He is saying that he is going to set the people free. As a matter of fact, that word Hosanna, what they're saying is, it, they're, they're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, or save us, set us free. That word Hosanna means save us, oh, whoever comes in the name of the Lord. And they were waiting for a savior. They were waiting for the Messiah to come and save them from their problems. However, what they didn't realize was that their problem was a lot bigger than they imagined. See, they thought their problem was the Romans who had oppressed them and the people who were just taxing them like crazy. But Jesus came to make an even bigger victory. Jesus came to set them free from their sin. And that's what I wanna share with you guys today. As a matter of fact, the big idea of today is this. Jesus came to give us freedom from our sin. I'll say that one again for those of you who are taking notes. Jesus came to give us freedom from our sin. Now, as you hear that, you might ask yourself, well, Pastor Lewis, I, okay, that's, that's kind of weird, but why do we even need to be rescued from sin? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to find out as we go through this story here today. 
And the first thing I want you guys to write down is this. We are born, us as humans, we are born captives to sin. We are born sinners. And every single person is born with a sinful nature. Now, this is some bad news because if you ever have kids or if you have kids at home, you know that you don't got to teach them how to do bad things. You know that they know this by nature. It's natural of them to just do bad things. There's nobody who has to teach them how to be greedy. There's nobody who needs to teach them how to be uh, jealous of their mom and their dad or of their toys. Nobody has to teach them how to be selfish. You know, they get angry easily. If you got kids like mine, they get hangry when they get, they get angry whenever they're hungry. And they, they just wanna, they just wanna uh, have everything for themselves. See, sin is part of their nature. And as we grow older, these things don't stop. We just get smarter about our sins. We get smarter and we now tend to cover up our sins. We try to hide, we try to sneak by and not let people know that we're sinners. As a matter of fact, we walk around life not showing that we truly are sinful people. We say things like, I'm a good person, or I I do good things, or I, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as others. We compare ourselves to other people. But the reality is that every single one of us is a sinner. We're all born that way. We try, we try to hide it. We try to cover it. But the reality is every single one of us is a sinner. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us this in John chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus answered them. This is the verse, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Meaning, we are captives to sin. We can't help but sin. It's in our nature to sin. There is nothing that we could do to stop ourselves from sinning. And because of that, if we are really honest with ourselves, we need to realize that every single one of us is a sinner. There's nobody good. Even if you think you are the nicest, kindest person, you still are a sinner and you are captive to sin. You are in captivity. You are a prisoner of sin. As a matter of fact, Romans 3 tells us exactly this. uh, Paul writing to the church in Rome says, there is no one righteous. No, not even one There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. You know, and uh, because we're all sinners, sometimes we do recognize that we're sinners. Sometimes we recognize that we do evil things. As a matter of fact, every single one of us at some point or another, when we sin, we kind of feel bad about it. We feel bad that we're sinning in any in any particular moment. Let me give you an example because because my kids, man, I tell you, they are the cutest little sinners. I tell you, they are super cute, but man, are they sinners. As you know, as as they've as, they, as they've grown up, I've seen how each and every single one of them, we've never taught them how to sin but yet they're sinful kids. And this is not something against them. This, is, this goes for all the kids. But that conviction of sin enters into our lives and we realize that we are sinful people. Let me tell you a story about my daughter, Lily. Um, on Saturday, we love to make breakfast as a family. We love, my wife makes this delicious breakfast. She varies it. She sometimes will either make waffles or pancakes or this French toast casserole thing that she does, or we have tostadas, or we have something fatty and delicious on Saturday mornings. But on Saturday mornings, it's also a time where I like to rest. You know, I wake up early throughout the week and I try to get some rest on Saturday morning. So she lets me sleep in. She comes downstairs, takes care of the kids, prepares breakfast for us, And eventually she sends one of the kids to go wake me up upstairs and tell me that breakfast is ready. And in this particular time, she sent my daughter, Lily, to go wake me up. So Lily 
as an obedient girl goes upstairs to my room. She goes, turns on the light, and she says, Papi, breakfast is ready. And, you know, usually when I hear this, my answer to them is like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll be down in a minute, right? And what does that really mean? That really means, give me about 15 minutes. I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll finish waking up and then eventually I'll make my way down to breakfast, right? And then, so she knows this, my wife knows this. My wife knows that when she goes, calls me, I'm gonna be down in about 15 minutes. So she doesn't, she's not really done with breakfast, but she sends the kids up to go get me so that I can start getting ready to come down. But in this particular moment, I hear Lily coming downstairs after I told her, I'll be down in a minute. She comes downstairs and I hear her tell her mom, mom, dad says that we can just start having breakfast. He says he's going to stay sleeping and we don't need to wait for him. Let's just start eating. Now, as a dad, I'm like, did I say that? Like, I'm, I'm, I was half asleep. I don't really remember saying that, but I'm pretty sure I did not say any of that stuff. I'm pretty sure all I said was, I'll be down in a minute. So, you know, by the time I actually woke up, I stayed sleeping for a little bit. And, I, you know, by the time I got down, I actually forgot about it. Forgot about the whole thing. I didn't want to call her out on it and, you know, just forgot about it. But in later talking with my wife, I was having a conversation with her. And I, and I, and I talked to her and she tells me, you know, this morning when we were having breakfast, Lily came down and she told me that you said that we could just start eating without you. She, she said that you said, just go ahead and start eating, that you were going to stay sleeping. And she just started eating. They started having breakfast together without me. And all of a sudden, my wife is eating breakfast, feeding the baby, doing all these things that she does. I love my wife. She's great. And while she's doing that, she looks up and she sees my daughter, Lily, with tears in her eyes. These tears that are rushing down her face. And my wife, she gets concerned. She asks her, Lily, what's wrong? What's going on? Why are you crying? And Lily goes, Mom, I'm just, I'm just so sorry. I lied to you. Bobby didn't say he was going to be down. And he didn't say to just go and start eating without him. He said he'll be down in a minute. I'm so sorry for lying to you. And, uh, you know, I, I find this story humorous because to me, it's just funny to see her repentance. But one of the things that it showed me, it showed me that in our nature, we really don't want to be sinners. See, we, we have this nature to sin, but then we feel bad. We feel terrible about actually committing the sin. And this turns into a loop because we don't want to sin. We end up sinning and then we feel bad about sinning. And it's a thing that happens each and every single time that we sin. And let me tell you, that's not a problem only to my daughter, Lily. I go through the same thing. I'm sure you go through the same thing. And even in the Bible, we have, a, we have an image of how the Apostle Paul felt like he goes even through the same thing. As a matter of fact, in Romans 7, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome tells him this. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. The law of sin at work within me. And then he has this existential moment where he just cries out to himself. And he goes in, in verse 24, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Basically, what Paul is trying to say here is, I want to do good. I desire to do good things, but I just can't. My body won't let me. I just fall into sin. I fall into temptation and I just cannot stop sinning. And this is a problem. This is a problem because this same exact sin not only stops us from doing good, 
but it actually puts us at war with God. That's what he says right here. He says, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner to sin. We're prisoners to sin, and because we're prisoners to sin, we become enemies of God. As a matter of fact, I want you to write down as point that down as point number two. Our sin puts us at war with God. See, it's important for us to, to realize a very uh, an attribute of God. And that attribute of God is his justice. Say that with me. Justice. Now, what the word justice means is to, it means to make sure that every everything that some that is done wrong gets punished to bring it to light that's what a judge does a judge will determine what the right punishment for the person who broke the law is and god is a just god meaning this god can't just forgive your sins without any punishment a pun a sin is something that deserves punishment and if god weren't wouldn't punish that sin then god wouldn't be just does that make sense church if god does not punish sin this would make god unjust and we know that an attribute of god is that he is just so how then are we able to reconcile ourselves to a god who is just how are we going to be um how are we going to redeem ourselves? How are we going to pay for the sins that we've committed to a God that requires payment for our sins? And the truth is, church, we can't. We can't pay for our sins. As a matter of fact, this sin, the fact that we are sinful people, it puts us at war with God. In Colossians 1.21, the Apostle Paul says this, once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. And church, I don't know about you, but I don't want God as an enemy. That's like the worst enemy we can have. Like, hey, going to war. Who are you going to war with? Oh, I'm going to war with God. Well, it's probably not a good idea, right? Like, that's God you're going to war with. You should not be going to war with God. God is all powerful. He's going to win. So, our sin puts us at war with God. But, you know, sometimes when we see this, we, we, try, to, we try to justify ourselves. We try, to, we try to say, you know, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm maybe not that bad. Or, God, I know I've done some bad things in my life, but, you know, I've done a lot of good things as well. So, God, you know, if, if I kind of do more good things and bad things, shouldn't my good things really outweigh my bad things? And the reality is they don't. Because even if you've done one bad thing, one sin that you've committed in your life, you fall short of the glory of God. You can't redeem yourself. You still are under the punishment. Well, maybe then you say, okay, well, maybe if I give a lot of money to the church or if I, if I do a lot of religious activities, if I read every single day and if, if I burn candles or if I, if I do this and if I recite this and if I punish myself for every time I do something bad, how can I earn my way into heaven? And the reality is you cannot do anything to earn your way into heaven. The fact that we are sinful people and the fact that we have committed even one sin that makes us fall short of the glory of God. And you know, you might be saying to yourself, well, Pastor Lewis, that's terrible news. Like, that's the worst thing I've heard today. Like, that's worse than the coronavirus. The fact that I'm at war with God and the fact that God is my enemy and I'm a slave to sin, man, that's bad. And to top it all off, I have no choice. I have nothing to do. There's nothing that I could do that will redeem my relationship with God. And the sad truth is, that's all true. Everything that we just said is true. We are sinful people. We are born into sin. We are slaves of sin. And because of that, we are enemies of God. We can't do anything to stop us from being God's enemies. 
And we might feel kind of like what we just read in Romans. Like the Apostle Paul saying in verse 24, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me? Because I can't do it myself. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? I'm going to die because of my sin. My punishment for my sin is death. But, you know, as, as we read this, this, that, that passage of what Paul is saying, I love how he continues it. Because right then and there, in the very next verse, Romans 7, 25, he says this, Thanks be to God. Say that with me. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, Jesus came to this earth to set us free from sin. And God made a way where there was no way for you and me to be free from the bondage of sin. As a matter of fact, I want you to write that down as point number three. It's the same thing as our main idea. Jesus came to give us freedom from sin. Jesus came to give us freedom from sin. See, when we were dead in our trespasses, when we were captives and slaves to sin, when we were enemies of God, when we were without hope and without God in this world, now comes Jesus. He comes in sitting on a donkey, sitting on a baby donkey, and he comes into Jerusalem as the victorious king who is going to free us from our sin. And this is an epic moment in the life in, in the life of a Christian. It's an epic moment in the life of Jesus because he is saying, I have come to bring salvation. I have come to give you freedom. And specifically here, he wants to give us freedom from sin. He wants to free us from that bondage that we were born in. He wants to make us, to, to redeem us with God. He wants to reconcile us with God. And even though God needs justice to be met, God met that justice through Jesus Christ. Because as we're going to study in, on Friday, we're going to see how Jesus became the sacrifice for us to be able to be redeemed for us to be able to be reconciled with God. As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of the greatest passages in the Bible, uh, the Apostle Paul says this, For our sake, for my sake, for your sake, for everybody's sake, He, meaning God, made Him, meaning Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was, had never committed any sin. Jesus was born of a virgin. He wasn't even born with that natural sin that every single one of us are born with. Jesus came and he knew no sin. He was sinless. God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, in Jesus, you and I, we might become the righteousness of God. God's justice was met when Jesus came and paid for our sins. And it had to take somebody who was sinless, who was spotless, who was perfect, in order to pay for us who are captive and who are at war with God. So church, what does this mean? Well, for us, it means, first of all, we need to be thankful. We need to be thankful that Jesus came and he died for our sins. It's an exciting thing for us to be able to say, Jesus, thank you for paying for my sins. Thank you for freeing me from the bondage of sin that I once had. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's the first thing we ought to do. The second thing we need to do is we need to receive that salvation. You see, Jesus came, died for us. And he paid for our sins. He set us free. However, that grace that he gave us still needs to be received by us. Jesus will not force you to receive your liberty from sin. See, some people want to be in bondage to sin. Some people want to reject God. They reject Jesus Christ and they want to stay in their sins and be captive all of their lives 
to their sin. And, and God allows you to do that. God will say, your will be done. If that's what you want to do, then you go for it. But if you want the freedom that Jesus offers, if you want the liberty from the bondage of sin and from the slavery of sin, then you need to accept Jesus into your life. And the way that you do that is the salvation that Jesus gives you is through grace. The grace of God, you don't deserve it. We can't earn it. We can't do anything about it. God gives it to you as a free gift. It is a gift of grace and it is received. How do we receive it? We receive it through faith, through trust in God, through trust in Jesus' work on the cross for us. So actually in a few moments, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do just that, to give your trust and to give your faith to God. And uh, just stay tuned for that. But the third thing we need to understand is this, in, in light of knowing that Jesus freed us from our sin is that we need to live following the guiding of the Spirit. See, if you've received Jesus into your heart, or if you're going to do that in a few moments, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you and now changes your heart. It changes that bondage. You're no longer bound to sin, but now you're bound to that Spirit who lives inside of you. Now, what does this mean? This doesn't mean that you're going to stop sinning. Sorry. We're going to still live in this body. We are still sinful people. We still have this flesh. And this side of eternity, we are still going to sin. I still sin. My family still sins. Even though we are saved by grace through the faith in Jesus Christ, we still sin. However, now that we have the Spirit living inside of us, we no longer have to fear condemnation. This doesn't mean that we keep on sinning because we want to, but because of our nature, we, we still have that desire to sin. But the Holy Spirit who now lives inside of us convicts us of sin and tells us not to continue in that sin. So now we live with the Spirit, not condemning us, but guiding us and helping us along in this Christian walk. As a matter of fact, that's what Paul continues to say after he says, Oh, what a wretched man that I am. Who can save me from this body of death? Oh, praise be to God, the Lord of Jesus Christ. Through him I can be saved. Right after that, he says this in Romans 8, 1. There is therefore, because in light of the salvation that you have from Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit, the Spirit who now lives inside of you, of life, has set you free. You're free. You have liberty in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The Spirit that now lives inside of you has set you free. And it's going to help you. It's going to convict you. It's going to guide you. And it's going to shape you and mold you into a person who is going to be sinning less and less, and less, and less. You're never gonna be perfect this side of eternity. That You're gonna still stumble, you're still gonna fall, you're gonna mess up. But we now live with the Spirit inside of us, guiding us in every step of the way. So in conclusion, church, Jesus, in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, came to show that he was going to give us freedom from the power and the bondage of sin. And now we're free. But maybe you're listening to this for the first time. Maybe you found this on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. And you don't know that freedom that comes with trusting in Jesus Christ. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. So I'm going to ask you right there in your screen with your eyes closed and your heads bowed. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But you're not going to be praying this prayer to me. You're going to be praying this prayer to God. It's a repeat after me prayer. You could say these same exact words or something similar. But the ultimate thing is for you to mean it to God. All right, you ready? All right, let's pray to God. Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming into this world and setting me free from my sin. Jesus, I believe in you. I put my trust in you. And I want to make you my Lord and my God. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to follow you every day of my life. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, if you just made that prayer, you're now part of the family of Christ. We rejoice with you. The angels in heaven are having a party. We're so glad that now you are a body of believers. And as a believer, now we're going to partake in something that we call the Lord's Supper. And this is an interesting passage of, of you know, after Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Jesus then takes his disciples and he goes into a room. And he has a, a, a little meal with them. They have a Passover meal where Jesus shares with them that his body will soon be sacrificed. His body soon will die and his blood will spill. And because of that, we are going to have salvation through the breaking of his body and the pouring out of his blood that washes us clean. Now, this is something that Jesus commands us to do as part of remembering his sacrifice for us. And we're going to see on Friday how, you know, that was a, a very difficult sacrifice, a very difficult thing that he did for you and me. And the way that we honor him and the way that we remember him is by partaking of this together. So if you're ready, uh, grab some grape juice, grab some crackers, some bread. Hope you got those all ready from before. But we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper together. Are you ready? Cool. All right, let's begin. And I want to read a passage to you guys found in 1 Corinthians 11. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he is uh, explaining to them how to partake in the Lord's Supper together. And he tells them this. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Later on, he goes and he says, Let a person examine himself and so eat the bread and drinking of the cup. So what we're going to do now, church, is we're going to take a moment and pray to God. See, this, this tells us that this is a very solemn moment. Um, if, if through listening to this or even before, if you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I, I ask you to abstain from this. This is for the body of Christ, for the believers in Christ. So that's you. you know, you're, you're free and welcome to join us in this. But before we go and partake of the of the elements, I want us to take a moment and pray to God right there in the quietness of your heart. It's going to be quiet for about 30 seconds to a minute. We're going to pray to God at this time. church let's pray lord god i thank you i thank you for your sacrifice for us on the cross god i ask you to help us to remember that this was something that you did for us because you loved us god we exalt you we remember you it's in jesus name we pray amen the body Christ is represented by the bread or the cracker, whatever you have at your home. Um, and this is the body of Christ, which was broken, or not broken, but it, it was given for our redemption. Let's partake of it together.
and the cup, which is the blood of Christ that paid for our sins, the blood that washed us clean. We're going to partake of this together. Amen, church. I'm so glad you decided to join us this morning. Uh, we love you, church. We're looking forward to these next few days. I know that you guys are at home in quarantine. Uh, God, we, we just want to continue to give you encouragement. So throughout this week, we're going to do something special. We're going to be remembering Christ uh, through the story of from here, from his triumphal entry all the way to when he died for our sins. And not only that, on, on a Good Friday, but on Sunday when he resurrected and defeated death and defeated the grave. And we're going to see throughout this week, we're going to have Bible readings every single day at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Would love for you guys to join us. We're going to have those up on Instagram live. So make sure you tune in. Church, I love you. Have a blessed weekend. What a great message today. If after hearing today's message, you've made a decision to follow Christ, we would love to know about it and give you some next steps. You can let us know by messaging us on whatever platform you're watching this on and we'll contact you and give you more information about that. By the way, you can always keep up to date with us what's going on at our church by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week. God bless you.